Hey everyone, welcome to Flavor Talk with the Barbecue Pro Shop Factory Team. I'm Brian Neal, co-host, aka Mr. Freak of Smoke Freaks Barbecue. Hey everyone, I'm Ann Neal, otherwise known as Ms. Freak, and together Brian and I are the tongues and testers of the Flavor Guide at Barbecue Pro Shop, the world's first and only seasonings decoder. And joining us is our fla- our partner in flavor, Jeff Belmonte, owner of Barbecue Pro Shop. Hi, Say hello, Jeff. What's up? Not much. Excited to be here tonight with Mr. Star. This is an exciting night. Yeah, everyone. Tonight we are joined by Mike Star. He's the creator of the Red Hot brand of rubs and sauces known as Blazing Star. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Excellent. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it is uh, great to have you tonight. Um, we got some folks tuning in that are going to be on live, and then we got a bunch that will tune in to the f- in the future. I want to welcome everyone who's here tonight. Shout yes. out to y'all, all y'all for joining. Feel free to let us know who's here. Maybe we'll put your name on the screen. And um, for everyone that's tuning in, we have got a really awesome conversation planned with Mike. Um, he has a truly inspiring story about developing a brand from somewhat you know, humble beginnings. So if there's anyone out there that's listening, that's interested or thinking about creating your own line of seasonings or sauces um, for the commercial market, this is um, really going to be a good conversation for you. Um, post your questions as we go. There's a lot to learn from Mike as we get started into the conversation. Um, truly remarkable, Mike, what you've done with your business, building it into what it is now in, in just you know a few years time. Congratulations to you. Thanks awesome. a lot. I really appreciate it. It's been a yeah. wild journey. Yeah, it sure has. And I know we usually have a lot of competition people who listen in on this show. And I hate to disappoint y'all, but Mike's probably not going to have a whole lot of sheeting tips for you because he's not really a competition guy at all. In fact, he's uh, one of the few on the show that comes from a totally different place, different background. But I will offer up one tip right now for you guys who tuned in before we get started, just to make sure you know. Uh, This stuff right here, the Reaper by Blazing Star, Get you some of this and put it on some ribs because this is just straight up awesome. Um, It's got a nice little kick to it. Jeff, why don't you pull this one up on the screen? Show the flavor guide on this one. This is one of my favorite rubs. This is one of the essential seasonings of 2023. Um, But this one's got just an awesome flavor profile with a kick that'll hold up a little bit better than a lot of commercial rubs. And in competition barbecue, you know, we wrap those things up in foil at one point, do a bunch of really unholy stuff to them. But this right here has got a flavor profile that'll survive all that stuff. So scroll up just a little bit. What do we got? A 3334 is the flavor dimensions on that. That means super balanced, leans with a nice, big, healthy kick. When I first tried this stuff, I knew that this would be my go-to for ribs, and it has been. Um, We've played around with it for competition, and we've done a whole bunch of just backyard-style ribs that we hang and let them run all the way till they're done. Um, I also like this stuff quite a bit on uh, popcorn, butter popcorn. Believe it or not, this is is (laughs) super good stuff. Love it. Mr. Freak is always talking about the Reaper on the popcorn. And, you know, just saying, if Reaper doesn't give you the kick that you're looking for, um, you can always kick it up, uh, kick the heat up one more notch with uh, the amazing Scorpion seasoning. Jeff, you want to put Scorpion up there? Uh, While Jeff is uh, putting that on the screen, I'll uh, go ahead and share that Scorpion is one of two seasonings in the barbecue pro shop catalog that have a heat uh, score, if you will, of five. So that's five out of five on the heat scale. So, um, you know, definitely not for what shall we say, like those uh, wimpy taste buds, uh, definitely (laughs) packed full of flavor and full of spice, but it's not too, too scary. Don't let the name, you know, freak you out. (laughs) <laughs> um, Mr. Freak has some stuff to say about Scorpion. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's, Anne said there's only two two seasonings in our current catalog for sale that have a five in heat, and they're both totally different. One of them is the Wham Hot Stuff by Willingham's. 
but that is just a totally different product altogether. Most mere mortals can't use that stuff straight out of the bottle. <laughs> just straight fire. And it was intended to add to other stuff to punch it up as needed. You know, and in a low and slow cook, like if you're cooking, you know, a brisket or something like that, it's going to take a pounding from the fire and, you know, eventually wear that down. But you still don't use it straight up. The scorpion, you absolutely can use it straight out of the bottle. And I'd say if you're if you're a heat head and you like some spicy ribs, skip the reaper. Just go straight to the scorpion because it, it's really, really nice, especially once it cooks out a little bit. You see those giant sugar crystals in there. I think those temper it a little bit to where it really doesn't light light it up too bad. Uh, Mike, what do you say? Uh, what what's Scorpion good on? I, you know, honestly, a little bit of everything. I, I developed all of my seasonings to try to be very well balanced. Uh, and so you could use them on literally anything. I have people that use them on, you know, chicken, pork, fish, uh, fruits, ice cream, you name it, you know, uh, desserts. Matter of fact, we used it uh, down in Texas and made a pineapple, apple, like quesadilla uh, with some cream cheese and just turned out phenomenal. We topped it with a, a little sauce that we made with some Asian bang, hoisin, and honey uh, drizzled it on top. And, man. It just, it's endless of what you can use it on uh, with the, the raw cane sugars and the honey crystals. They help melt the seasoning and not burn like a lot of other seasonings too that have sugars in them. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I noticed right away the first time we tested it and you could see it in those pictures Jeff was showing. The sugar crystals are really, really big, like even bigger than like a turbinado. They're just big old chunks where if you taste it out of the bottle, you know, you, oh, they're pretty crunchy. And I, I wanted to ask about that versus, you know, your standard granulated sugar. It so if you grind it down, right, and some people will do that, right, if you grind those sugars down that I use, then what's going to happen is it's going to melt faster, which eventually is going to make it burn, in it, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. But keeping them in the crystal form, it's going to melt on its own at a different temperature range, which is actually going to just make it form almost like a glaze on top of your product. So I guess you could say it's more like a dry form of a sauce, you know, yeah. when it's uh, in its current state. Yeah, I think maybe that is one reason I like it so much on ribs. The color that you get off them is just out of this world fantastic. And I get, yeah, and I get, yeah you're, that glaze you're talking about is part of it. Yeah, a lot of people tell me they're they're shocked by the the color that it brings because they when they they look at a lot of uh, products that are overpowered with paprika to give it color, mm -hmm. whereas mine isn't so much. I mean, yeah, obviously we do use paprika in our seasoning, but uh, the sugars actually help bring that color out the way uh, from the crystal forms. Yeah, the way barbecue's meant to be with that great mahogany bark, right? Yep, for sure. Awesome. So we're we're going to come back uh, to flavors, obviously, because Blazing Star Barbecue has a ton of awesome flavors. But um, I would really like, Mike, if we could start with a little bit of background and introduction for some of the folks that might be tuning in that don't know you too well. For uh, sure. Tell us all where you're located, what all you do, and uh, what all your your brand Blazing Star Barbecue is involved in. For sure. So I am uh, located in Pahrump, Nevada. Uh, easiest way to me to describe it is I'm in between Las Vegas and Death Valley. So uh, in the heat of the desert is where I'm at. Hence the kind of the logo that you see my label. You've got the mountains and the blazing heat uh, of Nevada. That's kind of what it is. Of course, uh, blazing heat. Uh, my products are all have a little bit of kick. Uh, my last name is actually Star, spelt with two R's. So that's that's where we get Blazing Star Barbecue to take a trip back. You know, I'm a, I'm originally from North Carolina. Uh, I joined the Air Force right out of high school. wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and uh, fortunately, I, I joined the Air Force because it took me on a a world travel, especially the first ten years of my career. 
Uh, I got to travel all over the world and experience a lot of unique cultures and taste unique foods. Uh, I grew up on salt, pepper, butter, and bacon grease. So that's what I, that was my, you know, idea of seasonings. And during my travels, uh, I got experienced to so many different cultures and my palate was blown and I would come home and from a tour, whether I'd be TDY for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever to a different country, I was a foodie. I liked cooking. I liked experimenting. So I would try to recreate some of the dishes and stuff that I tasted along my travels. And uh, probably as early as 2000, I was uh, making my own seasonings and sauces, just kind of playing around with it. So how did you land in, uh, how'd you land in Pahrump? I think I've been through there a few times. You yeah. live in Purdue and I passed through on my way to Vegas. So I got my assignment uh, after 10 years in the military. I got assigned to Las Vegas area and spent five, five years and went to Korea, come back to Las Vegas was where I finished up in 2015. We kind of liked the area, but we didn't want to live in Las Vegas because of uh you know it was just i'm a country boy i like having privacy and quietness and stuff like that so not a lot of that in vegas <laughs> no there's not i mean they're building on top of everything out there you know so we moved to Pahrump. it was uh, we had some friends that lived out here we moved out here opened up an asian market uh it was meant for my wife uh i had another business going on an online business at the time frame a military challenge coin business and uh Anyway, she got pregnant. Uh, I had started cooking, doing Asian barbecue. Next thing you know, it was my store, more or less. And I was running the Asian market and running the market at the same time frame. And How big is take- Trump now? The last time I was there, it's probably been 25 years. It did not seem like a big place at all. No, it's not a big. It's, it's grown a lot. I would say since the boom, the housing boom of 04, it's probably gained about 20,000 uh, people. Uh, and before that, it was probably 35,000. So we're probably close to 55,000 now. Uh, with more coming in, uh, you got a lot more. Vegas can only expand so far. So Prump is the closest kind of decent sized town uh, to Vegas. So, so it's when- growing. So the rest of your life, when you're not making things happen for a blazing star, um, what else do you like to do for work or fun out there in Pahrump? Well, it's a, we're, we're known for uh, a lot of trail riding and stuff like that. When I have time, I like riding in the trails, going off-roading. That's a, kind of a fun thing that I like to do. I like to go fishing, but there's not a lot of water <laughs> near me. So, Are you two yeah. wheels or four wheels, Mike? What's that? Four wheels. Yeah. yeah. Side wow. by sides. Yep. Okay. I got to tell you, Mike, you have some of the most beautiful backdrops of the videos that you uh, post, your reels and whatnot on social media. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm not only interested in what it is that you're mm-hmm. cooking, of course, but yeah. boy, just watch that yeah, all day before long. Before we forget, yeah. you got to plug those two channels because even if you're not into seasonings and a nerd like I am, <laughs> just the pictures that you've got are really, really nice. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Folks find you on the socials. Pretty much at Blazing Star BBQ on all channels. Uh, so if you just search Blazing Star BBQ or put in at Blazing Star BBQ, you're going to find us. But yeah, we've got snow all on the mountains right now, so it looks beautiful out there. I actually thought about doing the live out there because the, the views <laughs> are so nice tonight. Wow. <laughs> yeah, is it still daylight at all out there? It is. Yeah, we still got some daylight out here. Yeah, we Sorry. ran out about 40 minutes ago. All right, well, let's start to uh, unpack the, the story of Blazing Store Barbecue and, and how it came to be. And we've already established you're not really a competition guy, and you talked a little bit about your travels all over the world. I'm guessing that's what somehow put you on this journey that eventually led to Blazing Star. So uh, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, yeah, where, do, sure. where would you say it all began in terms of this crazy journey? You've been on? Well, I would say I, I kind of really started. I mean, I was cooking and, and experimenting all my time in the military, but really it wasn't until after I got out of the military. The Asian market, definitely the Asian bang sauce that I have 
out today. That was developed then. Uh, the My pork and rub, which I used to call uh, my house sauce, that was developed, you know, in those early stages. We helped a, a lot of our friends open up uh, multiple restaurants in, in Las Vegas. We had actually almost opened one ourselves, but decided against it after helping so many people <laughs> with their restaurants and said, no, nah, this is not what we want to do. Uh, so I was just, you know, experimenting a lot and, you know, just a backyard guy. That was it. And then all of a sudden, pre COVID, one of our friends uh, reached out to us and said, Hey, we got another restaurant. We need your help. A lot of the stuff that I would do for restaurants was, I would install security cameras, stereo systems, create their websites, get their Yelp established, social media accounts established and stuff like that and kind of help them uh, doing that type of stuff. And that's what they wanted me to do. Uh, I showed up this time. It said it was a barbecue restaurant. And I was like, whoa, most of the restaurants were all Filipino or Vietnamese. Uh, and that's what, you know, mostly I dealt with and. Anyways, I was like, wow, okay, let's help you there. Then they were like, well, we need more help too on the barbecue side of the house. We know you do a lot of barbecue. You make your own sauces and seasonings. So I these like, folks yeah. that started a barbecue restaurant, but they weren't all that barbecue? No, they were more, they had a, a, a good menu as far as the soul food goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the barbecue side of the house, they didn't, meaning they cooked barbecue, but it wasn't really their their specialty, right? Yep. So I had to help them with their smoker, you know, just kind of holding stuff, you know, teach them different ways of holding their barbecue and stuff like that. And they asked to try one of my sauces. So I brought in my original barbecue sauce. They loved it and said, Hey, can we use it in the restaurant? And I was like, well, how does that work? And they're like, well, you make it and we buy it from you. I'm like, <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, so when started you say doing your original barbecue sauce. Was this something that you had sold before? Or you mean, no, this, you no, this was, somewhere. I would, I would make, po yeah, basically. I mean, I, I made them a fresh batch when I brought it in, but I would make posts. I was always cooking and posting on my personal page. I didn't have like blazing star did not exist. Even though uh, in 2018, I did post a picture of a bottle of sauce and I wrote on the label, I had a label and I wrote on there blazing and then put a star and then BBQ <laughs> on it in 2018. So anyways, yeah, when I hope you have a picture of that. So I do, I, I do. Awesome. I actually have, those are amazing. Uh, yeah. I actually have the original, that bottle with a label on it too. Uh, but so when that approached me, I was like, well, I got to think of a name. And so I have a graphic designer uh, that I, that has worked with me for like 10, 12 years. And I had him design this logo for me. I gave him ideas and he designed the logo. I created a social media page, but really I created it to promote their social media. I was really trying to drive traffic to their restaurant and then COVID hit uh, and then of course we all know what happened there. You know, things went on halt. Vegas was worse than a lot of places. And, uh, they started having to cut, you know, uh, prices on everything. They had to try to cut, you know, stuff down and my sauce was not cheap. And so I had traction on, you know, stuff on social media. People were starting uh oh! Looks like uh -oh. we're having technical difficulties with our yeah. guests. There we're, back. we're back right as we were starting to talk about social media, which I was very curious. You, you know, you did a lot of setup for you know the businesses that you were involved in, and now you know you've got your graphic designer buddy, you've got your amazing story of your logo and your brand, and you're launching that brand. And I, I don't know, was social one of the first, I guess, vehicles for you of getting the word out about Blazing Star? Oh, I think you yeah. might be muted or you might be muted. We can see you, but we can't hear you. I'm guessing that social media was indeed one of the very first. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've lost Mike. 
He's doing the right thing. Quit and rejoin. That's you all know, that's in tech, sometimes <laughs> back in while we're waiting, right. let's give some shout outs. Chris, thanks for joining. Brian Scholes, Todd Burkhart. Thanks. Yeah, hey Chris. Good evening, Brian. Good evening to all. Dirk and Todd, thanks for coming tonight. Dirk, yeah, that Asian sauce. Todd, yes. no doubt we're going to talk about the all-in-one. That is not a product that Barbecue Pro Shop carries currently, but love to learn a little bit more about it. We're adding and, little uh, by little. Yeah. There we go. Hey, Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. I'm very That's sorry okay. about that. No That's problem. okay. We were uh, chatting about getting the word out about Blazing Star and your experience with social media. And for all those folks out there, you know, talk to us about launching that brand. For sure. So I didn't have, with COVID going on, I didn't have a way of getting out there uh, other than social media. So I just started posting about it. And then people started reaching out to me and asking me, how do they buy my product? And I was like, uh, you got PayPal? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, you know, I had to figure it all out and started just posting on Instagram mostly and was getting traction through there because more and more people were looking to experiment and try new things. Was and that then, your goal at that point? Were you, were you thinking after the restaurant thing kind of slowed down that you were going to try and launch this commercially? Is yeah. The idea? I, yeah. So we were, I was starting to get enough feedback, you know, from, the sauces both at the restaurant and then a couple people buying you know people starting to buy my sauce and they were telling me that man this is better than you know and this was just my sauces at the time frame so then i came out with a couple seasonings uh that you know i came out with my basically the all-in-one beef and pork and is really what i came out with initially and the feedback uh was really good uh you know, from the seasonings, it was better than my sauces. And at this point, we started working with a co-packer, uh, worked with the shed barbecue down in Ocean Springs, Mississippi with our sauces. And I was still doing the seasonings at home. And I was getting to the point where it was just, you know, becoming too much for me. So then I had to get a co-packer and start having the sauces and then eventually the seasonings. So you made. were mixing seasonings and boxing them and shipping them all out of the house, huh? Yeah, everything was – I was making the sauces. I was making five-gallon batches at a time of the sauces and then seasonings. I was making, you know, probably 10 pounds at a time, you know, and uh, so mixing each one of them up. In those very early days when you're basically, you know, running out of the living room, what were you using to keep track of orders and shipping and all of that stuff? Did you have technology working for you already or were you just? Well, yeah, I was, I had a, I had a website. So I built a, a basic website, you know, I have, you know, experience and all that stuff. So I had uh, created that, you know, right away and was running orders left and right through there. And then TikTok was probably the biggest boost for me. I had saw the video, the the guy on the skateboard, you know, <laughs> with ocean spray, listen to Journey. And I saw that basically that ocean spray has sold more uh, products in two months than they had sold in the two previous years. And I was like, okay, I, maybe I need to check out this TikTok a little more. Checked it out. Of course, I was leery being a military guy. Uh, and everything you, you'd heard, China, blah, 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 and then girls dancing and this, that, and other. Anyways, I did it, got on there, and started figuring out, I've got to start making videos. I've got to become a content creator and start showing people how to use my products. And that really took off and kind of, I think, kick-started everything. And then the other social media platforms fell in hand doing the exact same thing yeah. or something similar. I think that's a really big insight right there, you know, kind of the showing people how to use stuff. And I think, um, you know, in social media in particular, you have a certain kind of style about your social media videos and 
that amazing, beautiful backdrop in the desert, you know, as we <laughs> talked about, um, but just the demonstration of what you're doing with the seasonings, how you use them, the types of ways to apply them, not just to the traditional, you know, um, meat, you know, proteins, but, you know, the pineapples and the yep. know, appetizers and the whole gamut. Um, so I, I think that's really, really interesting and a real big insight. You know, a lot of people that have seasonings, um, that want to get the word out about seasonings, that's a really fantastic way, in my opinion, um, to, to demonstrate, you know, the many ways that you can apply that seasoning. Totally. So, uh, seeing Dano, Dano, uh, Dano seasoning, he really, I kind of learned a lot from him watching his videos and saw how quick people reacted, good and bad, right? You know, uh, I took the word barbecue off of my seasonings when I came out with them. So you'll notice the BBQ is not on my seasoning logos because I didn't want people to think that my products were just for barbecue. Uh, so that was a, a key thing that we did. And of course, with my videos, I try to cook on different things. So one day I'll cook on a flat top griddle, next day on a Weber kettle, the next day on an offset smoker, the next day on a pellet smoker, hey, cotton Todd, gin smoker. Jen, how you liking that? I love it. I love, I have three cotton gin smokers and I love cooking on them. I love the versatility of them. Uh, they're great smokers. You can do so many different things with them. Uh, and I'll cook on a stove top or an air fryer, stuff like that too. Cause I want to just show people the versatility of the seasonings. You can't hold people's hands when they're in the store picking out a seasoning. So if you can help guide them, uh, through a video, uh, I think it's a great way to make it happen. Absolutely. So I'm not real familiar with uh, cotton gin, but I just pulled them up online here. It looks like they've got a few different designs. You cook on their drum smokers, or on the yeah, I have a. Or... It's called the Harvester, uh, okay. the drum smoker that they have that has the door. So they're kind of the, kind of the. I think the creator of that style drum smoker. Oh, wow, that's here. I'm going to see if I can. Can I share here real quick, Jeff? I want to try and show folks what this thing looks so like. So the door to refuel? Yeah, so you can, it's easy to, to throw in wood chunks in there uh, on the fly and you won't lose temps because it's it's so quick to do it. So many different things. Yeah, I've shown videos of where I, I'll i hang uh, meats and then sear them right, I got it uh, on the deflector plates. There's so many different functions you can use with that drum smoker all right here we go we got a picture yep. on here let me see i think that'll be a picture a little more representative oh wow here. look at that thing that's cool yeah i've i've that's never cool. seen one like this uh, ann and i cook on uh, a similar design but it you'll you access it from the top only and you mm -hmm. load it one time um, but this is pretty wild being able to access, you know, two or three different shelves at once. I, I really yeah, I like being able to throw in a wood chunk in there, especially on a long cook, you know. But also on the door, too. Uh, most people that have them, they put uh, their own branded logo on the door so he can do that. I've got a pretty cool one that the first one we had done, it's actually wrapped. We have a heat shield around it and it's wrapped and it looks like my Reaper bottle. <laughs> so it's it's, uh, it's it's basically got the label of my Reaper rub on it, well, that, so it's pretty cool. That seems like a pretty cool thing to have. That's awesome. Sure. I think it's interesting, Mike. Um, you mentioned taking the word barbecue off, you know, your labels, and I think um, you know, just in terms of understanding your audience, you know, your target customer, who you're going after. I, I know, you know, for me personally, in my barbecue journey it took some time for me to get over the fact that something said it was a barbecue rub that meant I could only use it when I was barbecuing. Well, I mean, we all know now it's just seasonings in a bottle, right? I right. Mean, you can use it in so many different ways. And I think uh, demystifying that for your audience and showing, you know, all the ways is something pretty cool that you do in terms of growing your brand. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. It's just like, the names of your seasonings, right? People uh, uh, ask me forever, when are you coming out with a chicken rub or seasoning? And I, and I, so I had to make videos to say, look, all five of my seasonings work on chicken to include my beef rub, right? Uh, heck, our pork and rub now has won multiple awards 
in both chicken and poultry and pork. Yep. So, uh, you know, it just, it's hard to, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you make a se seasoning that's well balanced, it can, it can work on about anything, but unfortunately you have to figure out a way to convey that to people too. Right. Because, yeah. uh, the, the average consumer doesn't know any different and they're going to do a lot of times what the bottle says, right. If the bottle says yeah. barbecue, they think it's barbecue, right. If they, if a says chicken, they're going to put it on chicken right? And so forth. So that's probably been one of the biggest challenges and things that I've had to try to figure out to try to show and understand, make people understand or help them understand. Mm -hmm. In our flavor guide um, efforts, uh, you know, one of the things that I've noticed about me personally is that a rub that calls itself a pork or a beef rub, I really love those on chicken, you know, right. I don't know what the right. label says because, you know, we do our own independent flavor yep. guide. I love it too. Chicken those doesn't taste awesome. like anything. It needs flavor, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Right, right. It so, is the hardest thing with selling these things in general is trying to explain to people that it doesn't matter if it says bovine or if it says beef or if it says pork. It could be great on all these things. And exactly. You know, and that's and it, and I and I like your your point of you know pushing that and showing it because that's the biggest thing too is with BBQ in our name, you know, to get people yep. to understand. It's like no, you could use this stuff on anything. You know, it's, for sure. Really, it's, it's not should. an easy sell. That's for sure. Yeah, you can and you should. We, yeah, that's uh, exactly right. <laughs> so, Mike, um, it sounds it sounds like you you've developed some pretty good ways of being in touch with your your customers. And I'm just curious, did you do you have like any kind of dedicated customer research function or anything like that that you use to help you understand what people want? I, I honestly, I, I just try to stay engaged with my customers in general, uh, and I think that's been a benefit both you know uh on me gaining information from my customers but also just uh showing them support so the more uh people ask me questions reach out comment i i try to respond to anybody and everybody i treat the people that have 58 followers the same as the people that have 5.8 million followers uh you know they're supporting me so I need to support them back. So I try to take as much feedback and information as I can. I ask questions, you know, no different than me asking if I'm going to do a podcast, what should I talk about? You know, I try to just listen to the people and get their feedback as much as possible. In my uh, days before my barbecue life, I spent some time in corporate America and there was a phrase that feedback is a gift. Yep. And of course, they meant different kind of feedback than the mm -hmm. feedback you're probably talking about. But but certainly understanding the pulse of your customer and what, what their needs and, and wants are goes a long way. So kudos to you on understanding that. I appreciate it. Well, I've had, a, I've had multiple businesses and, you know, dealt with customer service and, you know, customer mm -hmm. support and stuff like that in the past. So and being a communications guy in the military for 21 years, too. You know, I'm used to communicating and, and sometimes, you know, translating and, and figuring out what people are looking for or, or trying to explain. So I think that kind of helps a lot, too. So let's get back to uh, the journey of Blazing Star. And I think where we left that off, you were uh, you were literally mixing up 10 pound batches of, of seasonings and packing them in the house and shipping them out. How how long and how big did you get before you had to off source that and start going with the co-packer on that? I would say sauces were about six months uh, before I had to look for a co-packer. Uh, and then at that time frame, I was doing seasonings too. And more or less, I kind of waited on the sauce process to get finalized before we moved forward with the seasoning process. You know, just because I didn't want to throw too much yeah. on my on my co-packer the time frame. Uh, once we came out with a Reaper rub, uh, at first it didn't sell, but once a couple videos popped off on the on social media with several people praising it, it changed the minds of people, and we really had to get kicking gear on co-packing because I could not keep up with it at all. Yeah, at peak, like uh, how know. many boxes were you shipping on a given week? 
uh, that was, I was probably on average for a while shipping 50 boxes a day, uh, of products. Uh, and it was, we were having videos going viral from different, you know, people, it would be nothing for me to wake up, you know, and have a hundred orders. Uh, yeah. So when you have a 10 hour, 10 hour job day and you're coming home and shipping boxes, uh, for four or five hours, going to bed, waking up five o'clock in the morning and shipping for two more hours before you go to work. It was, uh, it was getting crazy. So what time frame are we in at this point where you're kind of at peak DIY mode? Um, you said it was like 2020 when you first even started to get into this thing. Where are we now? Uh, at this time frame, we're probably summer, June of 2021. Uh, I would say it took me a good six months on TikTok to really get like good traction. Uh, I mean, I would get hits here and there that would pop off and, and bring me some decent orders, but it was probably the middle of 2021 where I was getting slammed, uh, you know, nonstop. Yeah. That's, that's an incredibly short time frame. I mean, and, you know, if you think about the arc of most products and how they come to market, you know, you really got there quick. And I think that's a lot to do with the power of, you know, your social media prowess. It sounds like has been number one, it's a great product, but, you know, anybody can do that. Getting it to market and making people want to buy it is the hard part. And it sure. seems like you really crack some kind of secret code that a lot of people just don't. Well, I tell people, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say your followers on Instagram alone, 32,000 and on Facebook, 59,000. I don't have your TikTok numbers in front of me, but damn, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's they've been, juice. they've been kind of stagnant right now. I think it's a lot of paid stuff comes in as takes over for, but yeah, we have TikTok with 350,000, almost nice. 80, 80,000 on YouTube. Uh, it, it, I tell people all the time that some of the best products never come to market. Right. And some of the worst par products are still out there today getting sold left and right, you know? So you've got to figure out a way to get out of your backyard and get it to market. And social media was definitely the quickest way for me to do it. Uh, I did hit a good window. I hit a good time. I mean, timing is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, got the products in the right people's hands they started using them, uh, you know, obviously at the end of the day, the products do have to deliver, yeah. uh, or they're, you're not going to have repeat buyers and, but you really got to engage with your customers. I, I tell people this more and more, don't just send products to people. Uh, if you, if you haven't had conversations with them, engaging with these people, you could be sending your products and they'll just get piled in the corner. So, uh, you know, engage, work, you know, build relationships with people, uh, make connections and get your products in the right people's hands. And, you know, it could go a uh, long ways. Yeah. So by, by this point in mid to end 2021, you're, you're really starting to get a lot of traction. It sounds like you're, you're getting your, your production in, in order where you can satisfy the demand you've got. Um, how did you grow, go about growing your retail channels? Cause there's that whole other side of thing. You gotta well, want to sell it. Yeah. So I, I really didn't, to be honest, the first two years, it was, it was too hard for me to even go to retail. I would not reach out to people. Uh, really. I let them reach out to me. So that way, by the time they reached out to me, they already knew they wanted to carry my products. Uh, I didn't reach out to stores because I was still trying to figure out production, right? You know, trying to keep up with online sales. You know, I, I didn't have the greatest margins either early on, you know, so there was a lot of things I was figuring out business wise, you know, that made it. It wasn't until I would say uh, mid 2022, uh, probably at my two year mark, I started you know, putting a more focus on getting into more retails. Uh, and then I quit my job in November of 2022. 
so all last year was a big push on trying to get into retail. I moved over co-packers to old world spices. They have a lot of distribution deals in place. So they kind of helped with that process. I got lucky and fortunate to do a cooking demo with home Depot last year at Memphis and may. Uh, I think that helped me get into home Depot. They actually reached out to old world spices about my product, about carrying one of my products. And then that worked in a deal with four other brands, uh, to go into home Depot with me. Back so for all you folks who, who, uh, I mentioned up front who are wanting to do your own thing, get your own brand going, make no mistake. It's an awful lot of work. And, you know, you managed to do it for a while before you had to give up your, give up your day job and start focusing them on, on this full time up to that point. Just, I would say by that point, when you're ready to quit your job, you've launched. So up until that point, what were some of the, the biggest expenses beside your time that it took you to get this thing to that point? Well, yeah, making a lot of, you know, decisions and figuring out like, you know, labels and all that type of stuff. I mean, that whole money situation was like a, a constant, like learning experience. Plus I was trying to travel around the country, uh, link up with different people, uh, to network and cook and get my products out there. I, I started cooking with different content creators. So they were using my products. So those travel expenses, they added up cause nobody was paying me to come, come, <laughs> come there, you know? Yep. So I, I was just kind of taking it a, a chance and saying, Hey, let's go do this, you know, pick and choose, uh, which events to go to, which I thought, you know, would get me the most connections or most exposure. I wasn't really promoting my products, but it was more, you know, connecting and learning from industry leaders, you know, uh, traveling with a shed, doing events with a shed, whether it be Memphis and May, American Royal, doing hogs for the cause, uh, and then various other cooking events across the country. So did you have any of this network in place when you started in 2020 or is this all just built organically? It's all, all built organically, you know, uh, a lot of relationships, a lot of working, helping each other. Right. Uh, I don't look at this as a competition. Uh, I think, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's so many flavor is subjective, right? What I like might not be what you like or someone else likes. Right. So I really focused on being unique with my products, right? So I can work with anybody, right? Uh, you know, the more I help someone else, the more somebody else might want to help me. Maybe not that person, but somebody else watching it, seeing me, you know, out there doing it. Uh, it just kind of, I just kind of built those relationships and, and still continue to build those relationships nonstop. There's a lot of cross promoting you know, happening, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think Mike, that that's also something that I've noticed about, you know, you, even before you have been our, our, our guest on tonight's show, you have been attending and have been a voice on our past flavor talks with other guests and other makers of, of awesome seasonings. You've always been a big supporter um, of Smoke Freaks, of Barbecue Pro Shop, and and with the other brands, you know, that we're talking about. The whole like, comment, share thing is a really big deal. And, you know, what I really love about what you're mentioning is the power of collaboration. You know, I think many times people think if you collaborate with another brand or another provider, it takes away from you and what you're trying to do for your own, you know, your own interests. And I think you're, you're bringing to light that you know, partnering and relationships and getting to know people and all of that really pays back in dividends. It's, you know, I think when I think of barbecue family, sometimes I think of, you know, competition barbecue family, but really it's this amazing, huge, big network of uh, supporters and promoters. So For really sure. what you've done with the collabs. Yeah, I appreciate it's, it. It's a small world at the end of the day, too. And, you know, what goes around comes around. And you certainly seem to spread around the good stuff. And we love you for it. So um, back to the back to that journey a little bit. I'm just curious if there were along the way, were there any uh, 
any big demons you had to fight, fight, fight down or unexpected challenges that came up along the way that tried to derail you on this journey? No, I, I think a lot of it, I had a lot of, I'd say distribution, you know, issues that I had to figure out. Right. And a lot of it was just me just trying to figure out and balance it, you know, numbers and, and, uh, knowing, you know, where to spend my money, uh, when to spend my money. Uh, you know, I didn't have a, especially once I quit my job, right. Because, you know, now I don't have, you know, uh, a really nice income coming in on the side. <laughs> So I kind of have to budget that. So there was a lot of that figuring out, even me making that decision. Right. Uh, I was waiting for things to line up. And then I figured out that they weren't going to line up until I just quit my job and went full time because the business needed my full time attention. uh, If I was going to try to take it to the next level. And, you know, it took me, you know, probably a good six months or more uh, after I quit my job to kind of find my way and, and figure things out, you know, how I was going to make everything work, uh, and keep, keep my family happy too, at the same time frame, uh, and making sure they were taken care of. Uh, but fortunately, you know, we did start getting into some bigger retail and, you know, there's a light at the tunnel and, you know, hopefully eventually, uh, I can start paying myself. <laughs> yeah, you sound like a lot of entrepreneurs I've talked to. You know, they, that's that really is the challenge. Is you just got to go through the dark tunnel and yep. you know, trust your instincts and trust your gut and come out on the other side in one piece. For sure, that's it. That's that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Mike, you talked uh, when we chatted before uh, before tonight. You talked about passion and money. Yeah. In, your, in your barbecue business. And I wonder if you can just share a little bit about that with the audience. For sure. So, I mean, I, I mentioned before that I've had multiple businesses uh, in my last probably 12 years. And this was the first one that I've been truly passionate about. Like, this is what I enjoy doing. If I could do it the rest of my life, that that's what I'll do, you know? And I think, you know, when you, when you start doing things for money, uh, a lot becomes lost in that. Whereas if you have the passion for it, people can see it. Uh, people want to be a part of it and uh, they want to be on that journey with you. Uh, and it makes it easier when you go through the struggles to deal with it. What's going on, Kenny? Uh, it, it makes it easy to deal with the struggles because you are passionate. Whereas if it's a money thing, then you know, you probably end up giving up on it and and moving on to something else. Yeah, there's lots of ways to make money in the world, but not all of them are going to make you happy, right? For sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Nice, nice. Well put, Mr. Freak. Well, thank you for um, taking us a, a little bit uh, through that through that journey. I mean, that's we are, what, four years into it now. And Yeah, um, almost. Yeah. May 31st, it'll be four years. Almost four into this, four years into this thing, and now more and more people all the time are getting exposed to some of these flavors. And you mentioned Home Depot before. I know there's some news on that front. So you recently got one of your products into that store. Is that right? That's correct. We got our Scorpion Rub in Home Depot. We launched, I think, January 9th. Uh, I was given an option of one seasoning. Uh, my distribution company recommended a beef rub. I said, I love my beef rub, but let's just face it. Beef rub just sounds basic. Uh, <laughs> and I, I didn't want to, I would have loved to put my pork and rub on, but I didn't want to compete with some of the other people that were going on the shelf with me. So I said, you know what? Traeger's got their products in there. They've got a beef, they've got a pork, they've got a chicken. The other products that are going on the shelf with me, similarity. I said, there's no spicy seasoning on there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with the Scorpion. And if people start buying it, uh, hopefully they love it and start sharing it with their friends and want to continue to buy it. It was a little risky move picking the Scorpion rub, but, you know, I I think it's a well, a big representation of my brand. And I I think uh, uh, hopefully it'll, uh, win them over and they'll want to carry more of my products in the future. 
and staying true to your brand and true to those instincts and true to what sets you apart, you know, the uniqueness of your flavors. Um, like you said, lots of people have a beef rub and lots of people have a pork rub. And I'm sure those products are fantastic, but there's something about scorpion, right? If, if you look at our uh, flavor guide, Mr. Freak and I do a kind of he said, she said, and <laughs> literally... Um, Jeff might be pulling it up. I said, um, as Ms. Freak, and you can expand that, the name Scorpion suggests something intense, and that's just what the seasoning delivers. So, you know, that uniqueness definitely comes through. Um, I want to talk about the, the rest of the flavors in your lineup. We've uh, talked about Reaper and Scorpion. We hit we hit on Porkin just a little bit. Um, we haven't done our flavor guide on the pork in um, just yet or, or the beef, um, but a couple of things that uh, we know of that pork and rub. Wow. Talk about the distinctions and the awards. Let me look at my notes here. First place this year at the uh, barbecue news magazine, rubs of honor and the chicken category. So a pork and rub. So it's not just pork. I know you told me pork right. is good on pork and this yep. and, that and the other. So certainly getting some love for pork and on chicken and at the NBBQA awards, just uh, recently second place uh, for poultry. So other than chicken and pork, what else do you like to throw that down on? Uh, salmon. I really love on salmon, shrimp. I mean, fish, it, it goes great on. Uh, you could do it on popcorn too. Uh, I mean, I will too. Yeah, it's That's one of my it, ways I test. Right. I mean, it Freak works always, great. He's always bringing popcorn in as we're, you know, having a movie or whatever. And it's like, what flavor is this going to be? So I was pretty blown away when he, when he surprised me with the scorpion, but yeah, pork in on popcorn. Ha, that sounds amazing. That, that no doubt is going to be great. So let's keep up with the lightning round. Uh, beef rub. We just got a hold of this one. Um, haven't done the flavor guide on it yet, but one of the first things that we noticed was those big old chunks of cracked black pepper. I love I that. Like that already. I love that in a beef seasoning. So what makes this particular beef rub so special? Well, I think it's the blend of Southwest and Asian flavors that are in it. Uh, kind of make it more of a kicked up SPG. I mean, it is a SPG by base, but it has a lot of uh, other intense flavors that kind of really kind of make it stand out. I actually get a lot of people that use the products, my products, like all of my products. They'll actually tell tell most people, they'll say that my beef rub is their favorite. Even though it's my least sold product uh, to this date, I still the least sold product, but uh, I get a lot of people say that's kind of like the sleeper in my lineup. So you say Asian flavors, what's in there that's on the Asian side? Well, it's more, I mean, you got to remember most stuff, believe it or not, and in, in, uh, is salt, pepper, and garlic anyways in Asia, but ginger is also in there too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So. Nice. All right. So continuing with our uh, lightning round, the Asian bang sauce. Your website, Mike, calls it a one-of-a-kind journey through Asia. And I got to say, just looking at that ingredient list, holy moly, banana puree, honey, sesame seeds, gochujara, am I saying that right? Chili flakes yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the Carolina Reaper powder and more. Holy moly. Talk to us yeah. about the sauce. And that doesn't sound cheap to make. No, it is, none of my stuff is. I mean, I, I, I try to use quality ingredients in everything that I do. Uh, it's kind of, I, I take it, the Asian bang is more on uh, Korea meets Philippines with my own little twist to it. Uh, I created this sauce at our Asian market. I used to make Filipino barbecue skewers, also did lumpia. So we used it as a dipping sauce in our lumpia. We also use it on our, our barbecue pork and barbecue chicken skewers, but it didn't have the spice level that I have on it now. You know, I added the bang to it. <laughs> uh, it was just a, a, my Asian sauce before, but I, I eventually, once I got done doing the Asian market and was using it for myself, I wanted a little more bang. That was where I added the Reaper powder to it. You know, me being from Carolina, that's a Carolina Reaper. You know, I like <laughs> using that pepper. Uh, so that's my mixture on it. 
it's not a it's not a sweet and sour so even though i mean obviously it has sweet and sour notes to it but it's not your typical sweet and sour sauce it's not your typical chili sauce it's not your typical teriyaki sauce it's it's its own little sauce so um how was it getting a co-packer to be able to make that? It doesn't sound like it is as straightforward as a lot of barbecue sauces. No, it wasn't. Actually, it was funny, and it will, uh, I'll do a funny story on it. Brad at the shed, yeah, when he first got it, I gave him a bottle of it in a mason jar, and he's like, he FaceTimes me or, or calls me on a video and said, he said, man, you did it again. I don't know how you did it. He said, this is a great sauce, but you got to change the name. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, you can't call it Asian bang, you know, and he's talking about cancel culture and this, that, and other. I said, look, <laughs> I said, I traveled all over Asia. Uh, I said, I, I lived in Korea. I spent time in the Philippines, Thailand, and other Asian countries. I said, I even owned an Asian market. My wife's Filipino. I said, I'm going to call it Asian bang. He goes, fair enough. Stick to that story. Uh, <laughs> but yes, that was the toughest sauce to do. Uh, I, we ran into some issues getting it, especially during COVID, uh, getting the stuff that I use to make some of it, uh, especially in bulk. Uh, we actually had to go back to the lab when we went to Old World Spices and spent multiple trips fine tuning it to getting it exactly where I wanted it. And especially when you're trying to mass produce it and cut costs, but still give the same quality and everything else it was definitely a tricky sauce to to put together yeah and you've it been through really it good. twice now i guess three times once for yourself once at the shed and then again yep the yep exactly yeah. do you think they're pretty consistent across that arc it is now i mean we had some uh, inconsistencies at first uh and that that came down to sourcing and so that's where we really had to go back and uh, really get into the lab and get it dialed in so we could, we could re we don't have to, I don't, I don't, I no longer have to source the product outside of the country. So we make it our own self uh, from what it was before, basically. Got okay. Got it. So I guess early on, you're probably importing stuff from all yep. over the world when you're making it at home. huh? That's correct. That is correct. Gotcha. Well, that's really wild. I can't even imagine, you know, like you can't just, I'm guessing, well, maybe you can. Could you just go on Amazon and get this stuff? Or did you? Oh, have I could, but you, you were, I mean, the cost, you know, in, in doing it, you know, uh, what it used to take for me to make the bottle. If I want to really be serious about, about taking this company to the next level, I had to literally go in and, and dissect it in a lab and, and uh, have some food scientists involved and helping awesome. me make it happen. Well, huge congratulations on getting your Scorpion Rub into Home Depot. That's a huge, huge deal. And uh, with that in mind, what is next, do you think, for Blazing Star Barbecue? What do you got got coming in the pipeline, or what are you doing? Well, I mean, we, we definitely got a lot of stuff in the pipelines. We're trying to get into more retails across the country. Uh, we are in Bass Pro and uh, uh, Cabela's now. We're just launching into Shields. Uh, have a big meeting next week in Orlando, uh, hoping to pick up some other retail distributions coming soon. So we're looking to get into more stores and I'm trying to travel around the country more to stores, uh, especially even the, the mom and pop stores that have been supporting me for these last couple of years, trying to go to these stores and do cooking demos. I'm actually gonna be at Proud Souls in Kansas City Nice. Next Thank month, uh, for their one year anniversary, doing some stuff there. Uh, we've got Home Depot demos at Memphis in May. We've got a Home Depot store manager event in Las Vegas coming up. A uh, bunch of things, just trying to stay busy, stay active. Well, if you're uh, so ever stays gonna relevant. Be if you're ever going to be in Jeff's neighborhood of beautiful Northbrook, Illinois, be sure and let us know because we'd love For to sure. pick up and do some cooking. Yeah, we'd yeah. love to have you. Uh, I'm always down. I tell people at this point, if if I'm free, I can make it happen. I'll do it. I, I want to get out there and uh, well, we experience definitely love and cook with many people. We love people. having you in the store. We're super excited to get to uh, – get our tongues on the couple of new rubs that Jeff, Jeff, Jeff just sent us a little while ago. 
Um, I'm excited. Our, what's yeah, that? Me too. I'm excited to see, yeah. you know, y'all's flavor reports. I, I can't wait. I mean, I love what y'all were doing with that. I think Thanks, it's awesome man. for the community. Seriously. Uh, I think it needs to be a standard. Uh, I love what you're doing. And uh, I'd like to see it on bottles, to be honest, uh, your breakdown, because I think that would go a long way for the customer. I tell people all the time to check out y'all's flavor guide. So well, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate all about it. helping yeah. people know what to expect. Yep. Yep. Help people know what they're getting so they're happy when they open it up. Well, on our parts, uh, Ms. Freak and I are just back from Memphis where we became certifi certified judges for nice. the Memphis and May barbecue competition. <laughs> of course, we're not actually judging. We took that class to sharpen our skills for the competition. Um, we're going to be cooking whole hog again with John Bonnet nice. and Team Steamboat Barbecue. We've been doing that for years. Um, you've been down there. You know what a big production it is, and yep. it's really awesome to have a – a team captain with a, a great barbecue restaurant. I'll plug them steamboat barbecue out in Wheaton, Illinois. It's a super awesome strip mall kind of takeout joint. I highly nice. recommend the burn ends with the Carolina mustard sauce. I'm Sounds gonna delicious. Say, I'm going to say go with the firebox hot sauce, but Ms. Freak is definitely right about the burn ends. They are awesome. Yeah. So uh, on our end, it's it's a uh, competition time for the freaks. Uh, this right. Sunday, Mr. Freak is uh, out at the Winter Burn in Des Plaines, Illinois, doing ribs, uh, and then we're uh, off to Wisconsin for the next couple of weekends. We've got uh, some state cook-off association events, steaks and shanties in Manawa, Wisconsin, followed nice. by Frozen Bones in Van Dyne, uh, doing steaks and ribs at that one. And uh, Mr. Freak, what else is coming up after February events? I think we got some cheese heads on the call. I know Dan was on. Maybe you can help us out here. Yeah. Is it he was Manawa on. or Manawa or something oh. else? <laughs> a, B, or C? A, Manawa, B, Manawa, C, you're a fib. Quit trying. Manawa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which one of those it is. But yeah, by this time next month, we will be rolling into Fort Worth, Texas for the SCA World Championship. Yep. We're doing steaks, we're doing ribs, um, and we're launching Lucky Lighter 8.0, which uh, I look forward to meeting you in person, Mike, down in Memphis. And we'll put for sure. in your hands. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank yeah, you, Mike. Thanks so for much. Here. Mike, thanks for taking the time, too. Thank I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. I appreciate yeah. it. It was a good time. Yeah, I think anybody who has has a mind to try and launch their own brand would be would do really, really well to listen to this podcast tonight. So thanks so much for sharing all that information. And until next month, good night, everybody. And we'll see you again here on Flavor Talk. Peace out. Cheers. Take care, everyone. Thank you.